for example very good example is the pakistani flood okay although pakistan blamed it on climate change they want a lot of money that is politics okay people have analyzed pakistani flood uh, the first paper came out uh, a month ago they cannot prove that it is due to co2 increase it could occur naturally because remember natural also floods occur once in 10 years 50 years 100 years so to blame every flood on climate change is stupid okay there are natural phenomena there are man in phenomena and uh, you have to carefully analyze and find out this conversation is about a topic that has to be on everyone's mind irrespective whether you're a millennial or a gen z or even from you know the baby boomers generation in fact i believe that this topic can unify the entire human race to act as one and guess what the topic is climate change climate change is real and it has been changing our lives and it will continue to change our lives on a daily basis to discuss about this particular topic i'm joined today by professor jay shrinivasan a professor of climate studies at the indian institute of science which is one of the premium institutions in india he has dedicated a close to 40 years of his life into doing research on this particular topic and guess what he is an iit and stanford educated scientist who has also not only taught a lot of students but has done enough research in this field himself today's conversation will definitely blow your mind it will also open your minds to understand the gravity of the situation called climate change Professor Shrinivasan, before I start this conversation, I want to I want to tell you a very personal story about climate change and everything. Uh, I stay in Bangalore, and uh, in the last ten years, I have seen that mm, our summers have gotten hotter. Our uh, there is a lot of issues happening within uh, climate, and when I have conversations with my friends uh, sitting on the table saying climate change, everyone seems to be like, "Yeah, climate change is real. It's happening." but no one seems to know why no one seems to know what can be done as a common citizen of, uh, of of the country and no one seems to understand the technical nuances behind it there's a scientific study and all that the reason why i have uh, i approached you and i reached out to you to have this conversation with us and the indian millennials uh, podcast listeners and viewers is essentially i be- i firmly believe that you know people or scientists who have worked in this field they have a perspective but that perspective is backed by data by strong data and not just a perspective in thin air because if i have a conversation with my friends about climate change i will just have a perspective but which is not backed by real scientific know how about the entire subject so firstly thank you so much for uh, making some time and uh, coming here and uh, talking about this so let's start off with the first part uh, of climate change and i want to start into history of climate change can you just tell us in brief about what has been the historical pattern of climate change in how many years so the mic is all yours yeah let me tell you that people didn't worry much about climate change uh, before 1850 okay because before 1850 for 10000 years the earth climate was stable fluctuation was maybe half a degree one degree okay. and that's why agriculture flourished and our population boomed okay only after 1850 that climate started changing rapidly okay and in the beginning nobody knew why but there were very intelligent people one of them was fourier a well known french scientist mm-hmm. who realized that uh, carbon dioxide being produced by burning coal around 1850 uh, will be trapping earth radiation okay but at that time they didn't have good data mm. on the absorption spectra of carbon dioxide so he was just guessing but very soon the spectra was obtained and a person like arrhenius another famous chemist he figured it out that co2 increase will cause warming of the earth he even estimated roughly it will be 2 to 3 degrees okay, okay. remarkable but the funny part all these guys who made this observations were in cold countries and they thought global warming will be good okay okay they thought a good thing i mean 
So they live in England. Talking about countries like Russia and, and England North and Poland. Europe. Okay. Uh, they have very cold winters, like now. So they thought if there is a few degrees bombing, is good. Mm-hmm. But what they didn't realize is that the bombing is not uniform. There is much more warming in the polar regions, much faster because ice melts, and that will completely alter the whole dynamics of Earth climate. Okay, that realization came only in the last fifty years when we had computers which could actually do the uh, uh, simulations to figure out what will happen when you increase CO two. Okay? okay. So till about nineteen sixty, there were speculations. But uh, there was no proof. But once the computers came, and we were able to actually do the maths, they realized that this is going to be a serious issue. But people were not convinced because it was a model, right? Mm-hmm. Computer model. So they kept asking, "How do you know that these models are correct?" Mm-hmm. So it took another twenty, thirty years to get accurate computation. Compare with accurate observations to show that the global mean temperature has changed. Okay. So that happened around the uh, 1980s. Okay, and there's a famous example of a, a NASA scientist called Hansen, who gave a testimony in the U.S. Senate uh, during 1988 uh, heat wave in America mm-hmm. that this is the beginning of climate change due to human action. Uh, but still, a lot of people believe that it was. A speculation, okay. and then the whole coal coal oil lobby got scared mm. because they didn't want to limit the uh, extraction of coal and oil. So they started spreading misinformation, okay. saying that uh, all these are wrong. These are natural fluctuations. Uh, ice ages have occurred in the past when humans are not there. So they mixed up human induced climate change with natural climate change. Okay. okay. For example, twenty thousand years ago, there was an ice age. Okay, we came out of that very rapidly, and so ten uh, thousand years before the present, we came out of the ice age in a very rapid transition. That occurred naturally, but today the advantage is because of excellent data from ice cores in the Antarctic and Arctic and models, we know how the change occurred, mm-hmm. the natural change. And with, with the help of that, now we can more confidently predict what will happen in the future. Can you elaborate a little bit on the natural change? Yeah, the natural change occurs because remember the Earth's orbit around the Sun is not a circle; it's an ellipse. Okay, okay. there's eccentricity to it. Yeah. And secondly, Earth inclination right now is 23.5 degrees, okay. but it was once upon a time 21.5, and it went up to 24.5. It keeps changing. And then the where where the Earth points today, the North Pole points towards Pole Star, mm. but six thousand years ago it was going in some other direction. All these three things affect the amount of radiation falling in the polar region. Mm. Okay, and that affects the amount of ice which forms or which melts. So this we can now actually simulate using computer. So uh, we have looked recently at a simulation done for the last twenty-two thousand years. model was run uh, not here but in america because they had the power and that model shows how the earth change from the last ice age to the present due to natural causes okay mm-hmm. not human induced the same model shows what's going to happen in the next 100 years okay since we are able to correctly predict what happened in the past you might ask before 1700 there was no thermometer okay how did you find This very clever method called proxies. You look at tree ring. Tree ring gives you an idea what was the temperature in that area in the past. So tree ring grows faster when it's warmer. Okay. okay. So tree ring is one way to measure uh, temperature of the past. Okay. Similarly, you go to the Antarctic and drill an ice core and bring out the ice core. Within that, there are ice particles. You can look at the ice particle and figure out what was the temperature of the Uh, environment at that time. Okay. Not only that, there are there is air trapped in that ice. That air composition you can measure. Okay. This is an amazing thing they have done. Okay? okay. From there we know that during the last ice age, the amount of carbon dioxide was less than, much less than today. 
it was 180 parts per million. Okay? Then as the earth warmed, it went up to 280 in 1850. Mm. Now it is 420. It's 420 right yeah. now. Okay. So this CO2, and a lot of people have doubts, CO2 is in parts per million. Mm. It is transparent. You cannot see it. Mm. How can it affect Earth's climate? Mm. Now, you need a lot of scientific background to understand that, that CO2 is invisible to you is totally opaque in the region where Earth emits radiation. Mm. Okay, And it completely absorbs all the heat emitted by the Earth in, in the infrared, Okay, which we cannot see. Okay. Now, we have all the data now. So we can put the data in the model and we clearly see how CO2 enabled the Earth to come out of the last ice age and came to uh, somewhat warm climate uh, 10,000 years ago. And then it remained in that climate constantly for 10,000 years, with CO2 being almost constant. And then we introduced CO2 by burning coal and oil. It has gone up and, and temperature has gone up very rapidly. One example is when we came to the last ice age, a one degree change in temperature took about a few thousand years. Today, one degree change occurring 100 years. So people say one degree is not much. Yeah, one degree is not much. But the rate of change is mind-boggling. Mm. So today we are changing the earth temperature at a rate where most natural uh, uh, things like insects and trees and plants cannot adapt. Mm. In, the, in the past, when the climate changed slowly, everybody adapted to it. Okay? Uh, for example, when earth became very warm a long time ago, the mammals became smaller mm. to get rid of the heat. But today, when you're changing temperature one degree in 100 years, none of us can adapt. Mm. So we have to make sure that it does not continue. So oh. the rate of change is faster, but the rate of evolution is... Cannot keep up with that, yeah. All our natural ecosystems have evolved, have handled all kinds of crises, but they all occur slowly. So, uh, so there's a natural change that's happening, which is also accelerated by... Uh, increase CO2 emissions, is that what you're saying? Or is it just because of this increased uh, you know, amount of CO2 emissions by humans? Yeah, see, before humans came, for the last couple of million years, mm -hmm. the amount of CO2 on Earth fluctuated between 180 and 280 parts per million. Okay. It is naturally controlled by uh, absorbing CO2 in the ocean and more uh, forests and so on. So, it, so Earth is a very amazing uh, ecosystem which is in delicate equilibrium, okay, mm -hmm. uh, until human beings came. Mm -hmm. So it was very well balanced. So if uh, CO2 went up, certain things happened, uh, the vegetation increased, it absorbed CO2, then it, it came down, and it, so it happened very slowly, everybody could adjust. Mm -hmm. okay? All uh, uh, animals, all plants, everything adjusted. Now we are doing it too rapidly. And that's what people should understand. It's not a question of one degree, for example, one degree is very small. Between day and night today in Bangalore, there is more than 10 degrees change, right? Mm -hmm. Between winter and summer, more than 10 degrees. Mm -hmm. So what is one degree? But you must remember that we are talking about global mean temperature, not Bangalore temperature. Mm -hmm. And one degree change of that is very large. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it is happening rapidly. Okay. And that's why it's melting uh, the polar ice cap. It is uh, doing a, a lot of damage to forests mm -hmm. because it's happening at a rate Natural ecosystem cannot adapt. When you say natural ecosystems cannot adapt, but you also mentioned that in the past, natural ecosystems could adapt, right? Yeah. Uh, my, I just have one very, just a curious thing that came to my head. Okay, 10,000 years back when we got out of the Ice Age, <clears throat> obviously uh, the Ice Age, uh, when we got out of it, then there were a lot of ecosystems that were evolving. So are you saying that the evolution process and the rate of change, they were going hand in hand yes. at one point of time? Correct. That's called delicate equilibrium. Okay. If we change things slowly, all of us can adjust. Okay. Okay? okay. Let's give an example. Suppose in this room, I uh, change the temperature by one degree in a couple of hours, we will remove our shirt, we'll adjust ourselves. But to remove one degree in a few hours, yeah. we may have difficulty adjusting. Yeah, so yeah. That, the rate of change is very important thing to understand. And also to understand that evolution occurs slowly, then occur rapidly. Okay, so the evolution has, has learned to adapt to changes occurred in the past because they occurred slowly. Mm. Now, now human beings have done something very, very unusual. 
See, the CO2, where it is coming from? Come from coal and oil trapped deep in that earth, and that coal and oil were formed by plants and animals, Fossil which were animals, yeah. compressed and then, okay. It took one million years to form that oil, mm. and we are taking it out in 100 years. Mm. So that is completely unrealistic uh, rate of change. Then how did we get out of the ice age? Where huh? did the CO2 come? That I for a No. That, if that I is, may ask a very yeah, ridiculous that, question, that, but yeah. That is a very complicated, uh, uh, what they call, carbon dioxide cycle. Remember that mm -hmm. carbon dioxide comes out of the uh, volcanoes. Yeah. When volcanoes uh, erupt, CO2 comes out. Mm -hmm. That CO2 comes to the atmosphere, atmosphere warms up, more rainfall occurs, mm -hmm. and when the rainfall falls on mountain ranges, it uh, reacts with the rock mm. and the CO2 and the rock react to form calcium carbonate which goes back to the ocean. Okay? And that calcium carbonate in the ocean it's a part of all uh, uh, marine animals. Mm -hmm. Their uh, skeleton is calcium carbonate. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that is a cycle that CO2 is emitted by uh, volcano. It is uh, by weathering, removed by uh, rain and so on, brought back to the ocean. Ultimately the ocean goes under and goes and comes out of the volcano, that rock. Okay. So that is a cycle which takes a couple of million years. Okay. Okay. That natural cycle has been working for the last couple of hundred million years. Mm -hmm. And we have disturbed that equilibrium mm -hmm. by pulling out a very old rock containing oil and coal, which was found millions of years ago. That's okay. But you did it so rapidly that you have just uh, disturbed the whole system. You know, uh, when when we talk about climate change uh, in 2022, going to 2023 in the next few days, the one thing that is very common in terms of what kind of uh, articles that are published is one where they talk about Bangladesh uh, and uh, the Sundarbans going underwater. Second thing is the entire country of Maldives will be underwater. Yeah. There's some prediction in the next 70 right. years the entire uh, country of Maldives will be underwater. There's also some very uh, you know, uh, glaring uh, conversations around South Asia being, they're saying that South Asia will be badly hit. And they said that the floods that happened in Pakistan uh, earlier this year was just a, just a, just a trailer of what's going to happen in the future in South Asia. These are the conversations that come up. Yeah. And there's another other side of the spectrum where they say climate change isn't real. It's, 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 it does not exist. You know, it's all fine. It's it's going on. I mean, you should industrialize. You should make a lot of money. Capitalism should flourish. Yeah. So on and so forth. Yeah, what you said was true. 30 years ago, because I've been giving talk on this for 30 years or more. 30 years ago, everyone said, you know, uh, climate change is natural. We have to adapt to it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and as a well-known statement by many engineers and uh, capitalists that Pollution is a price you must pay for progress. Okay? It's unavoidable. Okay? Uh, I don't think that statement can be made today. <laughs> no, it should not be made today. Well, to me, that's a completely wrong notion that uh, without pollution, progress cannot occur. Okay? Yeah. In the last hundred years, in a hurry to progress, we took shortcuts. Okay? Uh, and we are paying a price for it. Now, everyone has realized that we can develop but in a, a very responsible way uh, and not ignore pollution. Okay? Mm. You can develop without pollution, but that requires more uh, uh, inventiveness, more cleverness to do that. It takes a little more time, but if you take a shortcut, you'll pay a penalty. Now, you must remember that when Europeans invaded uh, America and occupied it and essentially eliminated the locals, they were shocked because the American Indians lived in equilibrium with nature for 20,000 years. Oh, okay. okay. Because uh, they were the Native Americans, yes. basically. Huh? Okay. And they led a very ideal life, completely in equilibrium with nature. And they intuitively understood that nature is very complicated and forms its own cycles. And we have to go along with it. Hmm. We cannot disturb it. Hmm. When the Europeans came with their guns and killed their bisons uh, in millions, one of the Native Americans asked, are you guys uh, crazy? How can you do that? Because you kill the bison, the entire ecosystem will collapse. Mm. And it happened. 
Mm. So to me, uh, that is an unfortunate thing that's happened that as we acquired more and more uh, skills, we, uh, uh, many human beings desired that uh, we don't have to be in human nature. We can do what we want. We human beings are the God's creation, mm. so we can do what we want. Mm. But let me tell you, this was not a view in India or China or in America 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago, in India, China, and uh, in America, they had respect for nature. Mm. See? We knew that we cannot control nature. This attitude has come in the last 100 years because of our arrogance. Mm. We thought we are so smart mm. that we can control nature and the earth. Mm. We cannot do that. See? Mm. What we are learning a lesson now is that we are meddled with nature, and now we are paying a price for it. Mm. So it is very important in the next 30 years we correct our mistakes, we have some time, and make sure that we get back to a situation where keep the CO2 at the level of 280 parts per million, and then things will go on naturally. There'll be, now and then there will be uh, natural catastrophes, which occur anyway. But by increasing CO2 rapidly, you will accelerate all these. Uh, for example, very good example is the Pakistani flood. Okay? Although Pakistan blamed it on uh, climate change, they want a lot of money, that is politics. Okay? Mm -hmm. People have analyzed Pakistani flood. Uh, the first paper came out uh, a month ago. They cannot prove that it is due to CO2 increase. Oh. It could occur naturally. Okay. Because remember, naturally also floods occur once in 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. So to blame every flood on climate change is stupid. Okay? Mm -hmm. There are natural phenomena, there are man phenomena, and uh, you have to carefully analyze and find out. I'll give you another example. Take Bangladesh, okay? Bangladesh is blaming the world because sea level is rising and it will affect Bangladesh. But they are forgetting that they are extracting natural gas in Bangladesh, extracting groundwater, and land is sinking because of that much faster than the sea level rise. Okay. Nobody talking about that. Okay? You must remember that we human beings are not, not just changing CO2. We are doing many things that are stupid, including extracting groundwater. Mm. In Rajasthan, groundwater is 8,000 years old. When it rained heavily in Rajasthan, it was equal to natural climate change. That water went into the ground, went deep inside. We are in a hurry to pull it out and spend it. That's very stupid. But you are doing it. It's a short-term gain. Okay? Uh, so these are the things we should realize that if you try to extract oil and water very rapidly, We'll still, still run out of it and we'll completely disturb the ecosystem. And in many parts of the world, I can tell you, not just Bangladesh, the capital of Indonesia, Jakarta is sinking. Same reason, groundwater extraction. Mm. Because in the soil, there's water. You extract the water out, you form vacuum, it will collapse. Mm. Right? California, the dream state of many people, is a desert. Okay? And they're extracting groundwater to grow all vegetables and so on. The land has sunk 30 feet in the last 100 years. 30 feet. Okay? So, these are all evidence that is there. We are ignoring it. So, blaming everything on climate change is also not, not needed in today's world. I mean, if you look, there are people who even blamed COVID-19 on climate change. Partly, they may be right. I'll tell you why. Once you start changing temperature at the range of 1 degree per 100 years or faster, then when the all the glaciers melt, Remember, the glaciers were frozen during the last ice age. Okay? They contain viruses 10,000 years old. You melt it, new virus come out. It's already happened in Tibet. Tibet, Chinese have extracted viruses which were sleeping for 10,000 years, 20,000 years. They come out. Now, most of them may be harmless, but one or two of them, we have not seen them. Mm. Right? So we don't know what will happen. So, and we have obviously not built immunity towards it. Yeah. So we have to be careful in dealing with uh, and I, I tell you, when it, it happened in uh, Kazakhstan, there was a, uh, uh, what do you call, a deer antelope, an antelope, uh, 200,000 died in one month, okay? People are shocked. Then the veterinarians came and checked. They found a bacteria which was residing naturally in the antelope for thousands of years, suddenly became more virulent. Okay. And that may be due to climate change. Okay. okay. So you must remember that when you change things rapidly, everything changes. 
from uh, microorganisms to humans to everything. Yeah. So viruses which were uh, harmless in my nose suddenly became so COVID could have been partly natural cause, but I can tell you that it is just not carbon dioxide. The way we uh, now exploit uh, natural resources in the world, okay, you are causing disruption to the ecosystem. So viruses will come out. Mm. So I'll give you an example: Ebola. Ebola uh, is a well-known. Uh, in Africa. You know, why is it coming from there? Because uh, Africans go hunting into the forest, right? And very hot uh, in Congo, and so very hot there. So they go bare bodied and they kill an animal, okay? And they carry the animal on their back. Okay. So the virus in that animal blood seeps into the human being and mutates and causes Ebola, okay? So because population is increasing rapidly in Africa, people are over exploiting the natural resource. Mm. Okay. So previously we were in equilibrium with the forest. We occasionally we went there to do something, but we didn't completely uh, destroy the forest or completely uh, denude it. That's what's happening now. And that's why the American Indians told the Europeans, you guys don't overdo this because we kill all the bison, there's a whole chain reaction. Mm. Okay. A lot of things depend on the bison. You kill the bison, something else, something else happens, entire thing collapses. And people have shown evidence of that uh, in the past, that you remove the top predator in any ecosystem, the whole ecosystem collapses. For example, in Central, Central India, now Madhya Pradesh, you remove the tiger. You might, I might feel bad about tiger going out, but the entire ecosystem will go. So when the tiger goes, the uh, deer will just explode. Because it, it has no uh, enemies, right? Yeah. Everything will collapse. Mm -hmm. So this is what American Indians understood. And all, all the people, even India, everybody understood that every ecosystem is delicately balanced. Mm -hmm. Okay, And human beings have to respect that. Mm -hmm. And that lack of respect has occurred in the last 100 years. In the last 100 years. Yeah, okay. because we were in a great ready to uh, develop. Mm -hmm. And we thought we knew everything. And we could do what we want. And now I think those scientists who thought that we now are changing, they're realizing that there's a limit to how much they understand about the natural world. So we have to be careful in making sure that we don't destroy the natural world because the consequences are unpredictable. So you're 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 an eminent professor in this field for many years now, right? So you would have obviously seen different cycles of conversations happening around this particular subject. Uh, that being said, I'm very curious to know what is the conversation about climate change right now at a government to government level and everything, considering whatever is happening in the geopolitical space today with uh, war in Europe, uh, with everything that's happening with COVID and post-COVID after the, the play out of this, which is yet to be seen. All these things considered, what is the conversation about climate change as of 2022 and as we enter in 2023? What is it? What is the conversation and what are the kind of results that are coming out of these conversations at various places like COP24? And yeah, I tell you what is happening is very surprising. But 30 years back, whenever I gave talks, people were skeptical and they said, no, this cannot be happening. Okay. Now, I am worried that people have gone the other way. They are blaming everything on climate change. Now, what they don't realize that we human beings have not even done climate change. We have done so many other districts of nature. Mm -hmm. So, what's happening around us is not due to just carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. It is due to uh, 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 water pollution, air pollution, plastic pollution. Okay? There are, we are destroying nature in 100 different ways. Mm -hmm. Okay? We have to deal with all of them, not CO2. Okay. CO2 is only one. Mm -hmm. Okay? Maybe we'll be able to negotiate something. But we also worry about plastic. We have to worry about water pollution. We have to worry about nitrogen pollution. We are putting too much fertilizer in the soil to get more uh, rain. So today you must realize that multiple things are going on other than carbon dioxide. We have to deal with all of them, not just carbon dioxide. And you cannot blame everything on climate change. For example, the sinking of Bangladesh is due to groundwater extraction and gas extraction, not CO2. Mm. So that opposition slowly coming in is that human beings are doing many things wrong, not just uh, CO2 emissions. CO2. Mm -hmm. 
So that, that's slowly emerging. Everybody is realizing that. And slowly, uh, for example, we have a Center for Ecological Sciences. They were doing their work well for the last 30 years. We are doing our work. We didn't collaborate much. Okay. Now we are talking to each other. Okay. And we realize but that... Why was this not happening before? See, I'll tell you, in India, uh, people don't work across the boundary. We are, we, we love to work in silos. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's our nature. So, introducing your work is not easy. I have to understand biology. Well, you guys don't understand uh, uh, climate physics. It takes time. Okay. So, people find it very convenient to work in their little uh, silos. So, it's changing now, but it will take some more time to recognize that you're working in big teams containing biologists, chemists, geologists, engineers, all have to work together to understand the whole earth system. Mm. So, that's going to happen. And to give an example, just last year, uh, Stanford University got a $1 billion grant mm -hmm. from one of the uh, philanthropists mm -hmm. to have a whole school on sustainability science. Okay. Which includes all subjects, not just uh, climate science. Mm -hmm. You have to bring everybody together. Mm -hmm. And that has not happened in any part of the world. It's totally happening. Mm -hmm. So this school will get people from all parts of the university to work together to look at the problem as a whole problem, not just a physics problem, chemistry problem, you have to look at everything. And that only now you realize that you have to educate also students across disciplines. For example, the way uh, engineering uh, has evolved for the last uh, 100 years, originally it was only military engineering. Mm -hmm. All engineering was for military purpose, okay? fighting war. Then after military things came under control, you had civil engineering, so military and civil. Mm -hmm. Then when the cars came, Military, civil, and mechanical. When electric motor came, military, civil, mechanical, electrical. And then computer came slowly. But today, we have to abandon all those classifications. People have to study all subjects mm. and look at them together. Because when you look at what happened in the real world, when you innovate, you have to learn disciplines more than one discipline. You don't innovate by just knowing one subject. So you have to now learn to teach students in school and in college to think across disciplines. Okay. Now to me, to me, it's possible because in my time, uh, when there was no information age, we were mainly spending time on gathering information. Okay. All my time was spent in the library, both as a student and the teacher. Today, that is not necessary. Yeah. Okay? If I open my uh, mobile, I can get any information in a second. So today we have to change the curriculum totally. Information should be taken by granted. It's available. Mm. You have to learn how to understand that and how to innovate. Okay? Mm. So the whole curriculum you had in your college has to be completely changed. Mm. Okay, Our college curriculum is full of information. You uh, absorb it, you the exam, you reproduce it and that's it. There is no uh, nothing, nothing we get taught on understanding the whole ecosystem, mm -hmm. no teaching about learning across disciplines. Mm -hmm. And until that is done, you will not be able to create new devices, new things, which will make the world more sustainable. Mm -hmm. To make the world sustainable, you have to come up with new ideas which cut across disciplines, which are artificial. Okay? Uh, for example, for a long time, biology and physics didn't work together. But today, physicists will appreciate that there's a lot of physics in biology. Mm. And biology will know there's a lot of physics in biology. So, both have to work together and a lot of new ideas have come because these two people have worked together. A lot of nano things today because everything in biology is nano mm. at a very small scale. And so, engineers are appreciating biology much better now. Mm. Okay? They are able to look at inside a cell there's a factory going on there, okay, with various things operating. And we are able to understand that's also an engineering factory. Okay, we didn't know it when I was a student. None of us knew that. So I hope that our education system all over the world will undergo a radical change because that's required in order for us to have a sustainable world. I mean, uh, there's, there's a very famous uh, saying, right? I mean, uh, jack of, uh, jack of all and master of one yeah. was the, uh, was the tagline, was kind of, was, was the main thing that people resonated with. 
a while back but today you can't just be a master of uh, one you you got to be jack of many and master of also a few no but that's possible today i'll tell you why previously it was not possible because information was lacking mm. today information is available on your fingertip anybody can become a master across disciplines very easily okay and they can combine ideas from different disciplines much more easily today than 50 years ago coming back to climate change coming back to this topic uh it's funny you mention about information i feel there's an overwhelming amount of information about climate change if somebody wants to read different articles he can spend about he or she can spend about 15 hours a day you get so many perspectives yeah. perspectives from industry perspective from policy makers yeah. think tanks governments students activists right. everyone but there's very few scientific or scientists who are giving out their perspectives as a scientist yourself as a professor in one of the premier institutions in india in the indian institute of science what would be your take on cop 24 and all these what what is happening with cop 24 and the paris agreement carbon credits carbon emissions firstly for the benefit of my listeners and also to me please explain what is cop 24 what is carbon emissions what is carbon credits and everything yeah there is a intergovernmental panel on climate change which was established in 1988 okay? okay this happened due to one reason okay. in the 1980s for the first time human beings realized they are altering the environment okay. where an ozone hole appeared over the antarctic okay? mm-hmm. it was a big shock why because we were releasing chemicals in uh, america and europe mm-hmm. we thought it will affect the local uh, atmosphere but it affected antarctica this oh, is far away okay so it was a total show nobody even thought it will happen okay as a matter of when i was a student in uh, america scientists showed that this chlorofluorocarbon which are there in the refrigerator mm-hmm. which is a very harmless chemical uh, it was considered a, in my student days a great invention okay, okay. Uh, because before that they used ammonia and uh, other chemicals that are dangerous mm-hmm. you can explode in the house mm-hmm. so when this was invented It was a very safe chemical mm. in the house, and it was, it was a great invention. Mm. But nobody realized this chemical did not exist much in nature. It was a man-made invention, mm. and that will create problem. They didn't know. Mm. Within about thirty, forty years, they realized that this chlorofluorocarbon, which is harmless, slowly uh, leaked out of the refrigerator, went all the way to the upper atmosphere. There, the ultraviolet rays from the sun broke it up. and chlorine came out okay. chlorine is a very reactive chemical all of you know yeah. in my school yeah. that chlorine went all the way to antarctica accumulated there and destroyed the ozone okay and then they realized that if this continues ozone will disappear from all over the world mm. and ozone is what is protecting us from ultraviolet damage mm. all of our cells will not survive in this ultraviolet radiation so at once people realized how serious it was within a few years of that ozone hole discovery a protocol called montreal protocol was signed by all the countries in the world to stop the production of this chlorofluorocarbon okay it was an amazing achievement the first major global environmental agreement that all countries will stop it in cfc slowly uh, remove and replace by other chemicals which are safer okay how did that happen people realized that uh, this is not only a problem There's also CO two, mm. so they said let's start looking at it. Mm. We don't know at that time how bad CO two is for the Earth's climate. So let's start a panel of the United Nations, mm. not one country, all countries together. Remember that when you are doing with global environmental problems, it is not enough one or two countries talk about it. Mm. Everybody has to believe in it. Everybody has to come to an agreement. Mm. Okay, so they realize that they must form a panel consisting of scientists. from all over the world not just one country mm. and they should look at the literature and tell us what's happening so it, this was formed in 1988 and they started producing documents these are called the reports of the ipcc okay. i was a part of it okay. uh, 30 years ago and this is an amazing document written by about 300 scientists this is not based on research this is based on research done by all the people in the world published already we just look at it collect it and write it in a form which people can understand okay so that report is produced and that report is then 
approved by all countries so you create credibility okay because in the initial phase of climate change debate credibility was a problem mm. people didn't believe us so now if all the country uh, work together and agree that this is the fact then that increase the uh, credibility of uh, our predictions so one by one every seven years they produce a document first second third fourth fifth sixth and so on and slowly ipcc became a credible uh, face and in 2007 the nobel peace committee gave, gave ipcc a prize for creating awareness about climate change okay and then last year the physics committee gave the, uh, for physics discovery okay so now climate science has reached a level of credibility which are not there 30 years ago but i am worried about the other extreme now that we are blaming everything on climate change that's also not correct <laughs> we must understand that lot of environmental damage is occurring in many ways not just co2 uh, nitrogen pollution and uh, water pollution plastic pollution all of them are connected to the fact that we are in a great hurry to develop without worrying about the consequence mm. okay <clears throat> so now it is important for both engineers scientists and politicians to understand that we should develop of course but we should develop in a way that we can sustain it okay what good example is india and china have a 2000 year old civilization okay it survived for 2000 years why because they are depending only on the sun mm. we didn't use uh, oil coal or gas okay and we survived now this industrial age They started in 1850. Not even last 300 years. Mm. For 300 years, we may destroy the world. Mm. So we must realize what India and China did and managed to survive. We may not survive if we are careless. Mm. So we have to go back and learn how to make changes which are reversible, sustainable, and be more respectful of the earth and its ability to maintain everything in equilibrium. Whether it's temperature. or what's the ocean acidity ocean is a ph below acidic it is somewhat alkaline now because of co2 increase it being more acidic mm. in another 100 years it will become so acidic that all the animals in the ocean will die all of them okay this is in how many years you mentioned again after 100 200 years 100 200 okay? years okay that's terrible yeah okay all because we want to burn oil and coal mm. okay so this is what ipcc has been telling that temperature is not the only problem ocean acidity is a, is a problem sea level rise is a problem and they are all connected to way we do things okay so this change and i also want to point out people who are strongly pushing for gdp growth and economic growth they economist they didn't understand environment they thought environment is a nuisance mm. to be dealt with okay? you pollute the environment then you somehow fix it that is a completely wrong approach okay? today the new idea is called circular economy 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 should grow linearly up it should be completely be cyclic only a few days ago united nations chief said that the way we calculate gdp growth to destroy a forest your gdp grows because so much wood wood comes out come to the economy economy growth but that is not a good growth right mm. it is a growth will destroy you What's happening in Amazon? The way we are destroying Amazon because we want that wood, it will affect the whole world. So, economists also have to understand that their single-minded focus on economic growth is not sustainable. Mm. We have to talk about a circular economy where everything is recycled, everything is uh, such that uh, you don't destroy nature. But I mean, Professor, I have this. thing about uh, capitalism and industrialization uh-huh. right which started in 1850 it all started in a few countries and i think capitalism as a model really works when you replicate all the existing models into your uh, into your country into your companies whatever so when you saw that happening in europe in western europe in the americas and today we are replicating the same model in yeah, but, like india but, china but, but do you know who uh, condemned it oh. an indian condemned it you know who that indian is mahatma gandhi. mahatma gandhi i want you to read this famous quote amazing quote eh? 1928 mm. 94 years ago mahatma gandhi was in england if he, he said 
if Indians aspire for the standard living of the British, will destroy the whole world. Because Britain has developed by essentially taking all the resources of the entire world and taking it to England. Okay? Yeah. They managed those, uh, uh, at that time, 10 million people became prosperous. If Indians want to do that, they will destroy the whole world. They'll destroy the whole world. But nobody paid attention to that. Mm. The 1928 code must be repeated 100 times. Mm. Because that man had an amazing intuition. And how they how we got. So, you know, sustainable, he was the first guy to understand that. Mm. Okay, but people laughed at him. A lot of people in India, I mean, my age group said, oh, he's anti technology. Not true. Mm. He understood that if you do the kind of growth British did, in 1850, you'll destroy the world. No. Maybe that, that comes from a lens of, you know, uh, plundering resources from other countries, yeah. being imperialistic and all. Yeah. But, you, but, but you can also plunder locally. What I'm trying to say is, imperialism was plundering resources of other countries. Yeah. But we also plunder in our own country. Mm. We have done it, I can tell you. In the last 35 years, we have gone and built dams in case we shouldn't build a dam. Mm. We drew out those tribes out. Mm. Huh? They were living a happy life for a thousand years. And you destroyed their life because we wanted a little extra electricity. Okay? And when they complained, I'll tell you a very interesting story. When the first few dams were built, the tribals in many parts of India said, don't build a dam. That water which is behind the dam, that will lose its Shakti. Okay? Now, people who were educated laughed at it. But they were right. You know what they were right about? That silt in that water is what brings you soil richness. Okay? If you build a dam, everybody downstream will lose that silt. They understood that. But they were not able to explain it in a way people, people understood. But they had an intuitive understanding that if you dam a river, everybody downstream is gone. There will be no fish, there will be no silt. Silt is required. As a matter of fact, entire indo plain is so rich only because still coming from Himalaya. Mm. When you start building dam, the still will start coming. Okay? So I remember when first dams were built, Nehru called it the temple of modern India. And some tribal MPs protested, saying, no, he said, you guys are ignorant. Mm. Now we know who is ignorant. Mm. Okay? We were ignorant. Okay? We were trying to uh, uh, imitate the West with understanding that there were people in this country survived for thousands of years to live in equilibrium with nature. I'll give an example from Orissa, okay. where the tribals, when they do agriculture, they they don't put one seed, they put hundred seed varieties on the ground. You know why? Because you can't predict uh, what the monsoon will be like. So there are hundred varieties, some will do well when it's raining a lot, some will do well when it is not raining a lot. Some of them will survive. Now, today, we don't have 100 varieties. All are gone. We have only few varieties. Mm. If something happens, we don't have a resource to go back to. Okay. They had it. So, the people who lived in the country for thousands of years, they understood how to live in equal nature. Mm. Okay? Those of us who have benefited from technology became arrogant, mm. thinking that we know everything. Mm. Okay? We don't have to learn from them. They're all... Uh, mm. uh, Illiterate. That is, as much as the first thing we were taught, which I realized was totally uh, wrong, we thought that we urban guys are very educated and so on. The rural guys are illiterate, they don't anything. That's not true. In India, even the illiterate farmer has more knowledge about the environment than we have. Mm. They understand, as a matter of fact, at a time when 30 years ago, when people in cities were saying climate change is not occurring, they understood it. Because they were watching what's happening in the in their farm. So a farmer is the guy most in touch with nature. Mm. You and I are not. Huh? Yeah, yeah. You and I don't know where the grain comes from, yeah. how the grain comes. Mm. We just go to the market and buy it. Mm. Those guys know it. Mm. And we didn't respect them. But the reason why I have this, uh, my perspective comes from the lens of uh, economic growth yeah. in, in a country. Yeah. Industrialization leads to job creation. It leads to, yeah. you know, uh, growth of a country. And when when the when the time is off for India and 
maybe china and other countries to actually uh industrialize and develop and go ahead that is when the west puts a narrative saying you know what you are responsible for climate change disasters you are responsible for this isn't it a collective responsibility for everyone yeah, i mean yeah. and it should also be like you know what i will grow at my pace you grow at your pace it should not really affect growth patterns of different countries it should rather be let's collectively solve this problem let's collectively grow but it doesn't happen i can tell you uh, with an analogy what is happening is the rich rich countries are like a fat guy in your neighborhood who tells you don't eat too much you will become like me and like a politic you say no 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 i want to what to eat a lot okay. so you must remember that west learned the lesson the hard way okay. we should have understood that and not go after the same way but let me tell you what the contradiction is but you know so like right? but anyway now <laughs> let, let me tell you uh, why why are why are asking for economic growth because population is growing oh. remember that 5000 years ago india's population did not grow it was stable so that is the correct situation we should have been in if you are a stable population there is no need for economic growth everything is circular everything is in equilibrium unfortunately due to the miracle of the western medicine our death rate went down rapidly our population grew rapidly okay it is it is something which came outside okay the medicine we practice in india did not reduce death rate it kept you healthy but did not reduce death rate okay it was in equilibrium suddenly uh, a foreign uh, system came suddenly cut down the death rate but it didn't change so whole population caught up and to take care of that you have to grow more thing more so this is a what you call disturbance to the system caused by medical revolution okay okay that is something unfortunately we have no control over it came from outside with the british uh before british came i can give you examples we look at my great great grandfather they are buddhist ten children one survived Okay, my grandfather had eight children, all survived. That's a change. Yeah. Okay, so people were used to death. People are used to affliction, and that's why they produced more children. One or two survived, and they accepted death as a part of life. Today, you and I can't handle it. Mm. Okay, uh, so this is a world in which we are again go back to the equilibrium. We will go back, but it is true that to sustain thousand four hundred million people in India. we are to be very innovative if you want to be sustainable not easy okay the challenge to all of us that's why young people have to learn to think very creatively how to produce more food without destroying the environment mm. that's not easy solution but there's no choice our population has gone up it will continue to go up for some more time but it is stabilized and we have to find out how to feed the 1600 million people at which we may stabilize how to feed them without destroying the country so we have to find new ways not copy what west has done hmm. okay in the short term it looks convenient that they grew rapidly by uh, what gandhi said by going all over the world and usurping the uh, resources we have to depend on our own resources and we have to do it sustainably now i would argue that today it is possible today our knowledge of biology Our knowledge about the crop is far superior to what it was hundred years ago. Okay, for example, today in America, you know that uh, those who eat meat, eating meat is a very unsustainable thing. Yeah. So Americans are learning how to make meat with plant. without with plant. Okay, if that That's comes, yes, if that comes, everybody can get a high protein diet without uh, farming animals. the whole american agriculture is extremely destructive you produce 100 million cows and then kill them and eat them and uh, everything goes away. all the thing is waste into the water so that will change now okay. so we have to get into that revolution and without that we cannot survive we we need and i can tell you very interesting question how do you ask india is a unique country among the countries in the world we are the only country where the meat consumption is the lowest in the world It's not an accident. Our forefathers, going beyond Gandhi, realized that with the population we had hundreds of years ago, meat eating is not sustainable. Mm. Okay, and various movements of uh, not eating meat were all religious movements. I don't know whether any of you know in Karnataka, North Karnataka, the Lingayat movement. Mm. 
which was against eating meat. That is mainly because that area is very dry. You can't grow too many crops there. Population started to increase rapidly, and the leaders knew that it is not sustainable. So through a religious movement, they asked people not to eat meat. Amazing! Uh, uh, it is a great evolution. All of North Karnataka, large fraction, those who are Lingayat, they don't eat meat. Now it is not just uh, for religious reasons; it is a region of eco sensitivity. Okay, so that tells you that some of our ancestors had very innovative uh, thinking. So before the British came itself, the large population was growing, and the kind of food uh, and the availability of meat was going down. So some leaders decided that to convert people. Into, and same thing, Jainism. Jainism also was again eating meat. All that were people who understood environment, it's understood sustainability, right. well before Mahatma Gandhi. Okay. When it, when we talk about climate change, uh, I have this one question for you. Uh, please help me with it. I want to understand my per capita carbon emission because there's no calculator as such available. Uh, to give you some context, most I have a refrigerator at home. I have a TV at home. I obviously have a car and non-electric car, uh, not yet bought an electric car, and a two-wheeler. Okay, and I speak on behalf of a fairly good amount of people in India uh, who are living in urban centers and who all have this. And I also have an air conditioner, though I don't use it. I only use it in very few days on the bad summers in Bangalore. Otherwise, I don't use it. So, what would be my per capita carbon emission? And uh, yeah, yeah. Would yeah let me tell capacity? you, uh, there are websites available where you can go and calculate that. Okay. Very easy, okay? okay. You just say carbon footprint. There will be a team website. Okay. Put all your numbers, you'll get it. Yeah. Now, the number which is calculated and officially shared for India is uh, it's around a ten or two per capita in India, okay? Compared to twenty tons. For America and uh, more than uh, twelve or thirteen tons for China. Okay, so we as a country are one of the lowest per capita CO2 emitters. Okay, the problem is we are one point four billion. Mm, okay. So we have to be careful because although each one of us is not emitting anywhere comparable to Europe, America, other countries, we still contribute to the global carbon. Emission because of our population. Where okay. are we in that? In top in the, in the world. I mean, total we are country? third or fourth. Oh, yeah. See, number one is China, okay. Okay, because of the population and high per capita emission. Number two is USA. Number four is Euro. Mm. India will be number three, uh, basically three or four. Okay. Now, do you know how you count? Do the how you consider Euro? Okay. Mm. So to me, but uh, if you look at per capita, we are way at the bottom. Mm. Okay. So the argument India is making in all world forum is, since our per capita emission is so low and we are still not developed, you cannot keep expect us to control our CO2 emission for some time. Okay. This is correct. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, we must recognize that we have a large population. We cannot aspire to have the per capita emission of China or America. That's not possible. So these are over. Okay. So we have to learn how to develop further. To make sure our per capita emission does not exceed that of Europe, for example. Okay. For example, England has a very interesting uh, target. In ten years, they are planning to make their per capita emission lower than India. Okay. Now that's when the trouble will start. Okay. They will say we are lower than you. Why guys? Why can't you guys? Mm -hmm. So to me, urban India is where the problem is. Rural India, I'm sure, has very low per capita emission. They don't have a uh, two wheeler. They don't have uh, air conditioner. <coughs> Most of them have very limited. So the lower lower per capita in India is partly because half the Indians don't have access to electricity. Mm. Uh, I'm talking about continuously. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so urban India has to think about how to reduce their emission. Okay? Now there are limitations. If you live in an urban area like Bangalore, unless there's a good Public transport system, you cannot do much. But I can tell you that the revolution electric vehicle is going so rapidly. If you use electric scooter, if you use electric car, and in Karnataka, two thirds of electricity is generated from hydro, wind, and solar. 
you are in good shape okay, in Karnataka. See? So you can live without any guilt if you uh, use electric vehicles and public transport and avoid using air conditioner as far as possible. Okay? Now even refrigerator, I'll tell you, is a uh, unnecessary luxury, I, I feel. Okay? I can tell you, in my first uh, uh, 30 years of my life, we had no fridge at home. Okay? Okay. Everything was fresh. Mm. We went to the market every day, bought everything fresh and ate fresh. Now you're putting old food in the fridge and eating it for three days, which is ridiculous, right? So to me, people are getting a bigger and bigger fridge. It is absolutely a negative direction. We have to restrict the size of the fridge, keep only a few important things, maybe milk or something, and learn to consume things within that day. If it is not consumed, give it away to others. For example, in my younger days, at the end of the day, some beggar came, we gave everything to him. That's it. We couldn't keep it for a long time. Every evening, 10 o'clock, beggar would come, we hand over things at the end of the day. Next day, everything was fresh. Now, we are all doing something unhealthy. Mm. Okay. Now, all of us think about that uh, lifestyle in urban India. Okay? But we don't have to feel very guilty because compared to the uh, developed world, we are much lower. But we shouldn't let our carbon footprint go up. Okay. okay. So everybody has to, but I can tell you how much your carbon depends on your also your occupation. Now, I live close to my place of work, so I don't have a car. I cannot feel very uh, virtuous because you live in Janagar or somewhere, you have to either take public transport or use your own vehicle. So you and I are not in the same uh, level. So we have to understand that. But, but anyway, I, we use laptops, yeah. we use cell phones. But I, tell you, I was very much very keen on electric vehicles for a long time. It didn't come because of various technology uh, bottlenecks. Now it has come. I would think that India should become totally electric for one reason. We spend $100 billion per year importing oil. Mm. Our foreign policy at the mercy of other countries. Mm. Why should we do that? A big country like India should not depend on others, right? Mm. So we should take first priority, cut down the oil import by going electric as far as possible. I think that's already happening as we speak. But very slowly, it should accelerate. Okay. $100 billion uh, worth of import is affecting our whole economy, you know that. We are lucky because we are getting money from Middle East uh, uh, NRIs and from our uh, software exports. Otherwise, we'll be like Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is in dire straits now because they don't, they don't generate enough money by export. You can get, get the same problem sometime later. So we have to learn the fact that now that electric vehicles are economically viable, we should push policies which encourage that and discourage use of oil for transport and power generation. If we do that, many of our economic problems will be solved. Mm -hmm. And we'll have cleaner air. See, one thing we all forget in our current climate change, the first priority in India is not climate change, but air pollution. Air but pollution is killing 1 million Indians per year. 1 million. Okay? Nobody is even paying attention. Why? Because due to air pollution, it's equivalent to smoking 10 cigarettes per day. Okay? And it affects me not when I'm young, when I'm in the 70s. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then you get lung problem, emphysema, and you talk to doctors. For the first time in India, the people getting lung cancer are non-smokers. Normally, smokers got lung cancer. Today, not smokers are getting it because they are, they are smoking all the They're smoking the air, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. this is, even in Delhi, where all our leaders live, they don't understand. I tell my friends in Delhi that you have young children, you have condemned them to a short life. Mm. But they don't appreciate that. So I, I tell my do the doctor that please go out and do more outreach. Tell people that the number one problem in India is air pollution, not climate change. You solve that first and then along with it solve climate change also. I think if you if you look at India as a country, what are the problems we have? Uh, one is uh, every year we get to see what's happening in Delhi with the pollution levels going up and down there. Every year we take it for granted that uh, floods are inevitable in a city like Mumbai and Chennai yeah. because of co coastal low-lying areas and stuff. Yeah. And then now we also have to take it for granted that even a city like Bengaluru will also have floods. 
yeah. uh, because of lack of that, that, that's not nothing to do with climate change. It has yeah. to do with a uh, lot of lack of infrastructure planning. Urbanization. Yeah, the way we urbanized in Bangalore, and we built entire colonies on lake beds. Yeah. What do you and expect? It's I mean, common sense. I mean, why can't they teach in school children that we build a whole colony at the bottom of a lake? It's born to drown, right? It's no, common sense. The point is not that. The point is every these I'm talking about for four major cities in India. Yeah. Bangalore, Chennai, Mumbai, yeah. Delhi, yeah. Uh, even Kolkata, even Hyderabad. They all have their own share of uh, issues. Hyderabad, surprisingly, they're doing very well uh, when it comes to all these things. But but they also are flooding recently. Yeah, they are flooding recently yeah. as well, and everywhere. I mean, there's yeah. flood, but at the same time, we also need to understand that unfortunately, we as Indians, we take it for granted. You start so making changes. You take it for granted. I, okay, that's what comes every year. I think we have given up on governance. We we have given up on our ability of a politician to govern, especially at the local level. I'm talking about at the level of municipality and at the level of uh, uh, city. We are not making our people accountable. Okay, mm -hmm. and secondly, also people don't realize that it is their own actions that are causing this problem. You go and build a house at the bottom of a lake bed, then why you blame uh, politicians for it? Okay. Now what happened uh, this year? The IT sector people built all those beautiful uh, houses in East Bangalore, which are flooded because they were on all lake beds. Yeah, the the, the, the the whole country thought the entire city of Bangalore was flooded, yeah. which is not. <laughs> which is Tell not me, why should educated rich people be so ignorant mm -hmm. that whenever you want to buy a site, the first question you would ask is. What is the elevation? So it's just about surrounding. Okay, that's common sense, right? But that is lost. People are hurry to buy land. They are looking around. That for example, I'll tell you. Previously, poor people bought land next to the river because they had no choice. Huh? Rich people always were at a higher elevation. But today, rich people are so ignorant. They are buying land in low lying areas and on lake beds without asking one question. Where is this? I'll give you a great example in Bangalore. The Israel headquarters is built on a lake bed. Okay, please go and have a look at it. And they, and that layout is called Jaladarshini layout. Okay. See the name, mm -hmm. Jaladarshini layout. So that area was a lake. Mm -hmm. Okay, the lake disappeared and it became a mm -hmm. uh, colony. That colony will drown. I can guarantee that. Because where will water go? Water will flow by gravity. So once you have built an entire colony at the bottom of a lake, mm. what can anybody do? Mm. What you do is now you have a high uh, power pump to pump it out, and where do you pump it out? You have to go all the way up and onto the river somewhere. Mm. So to me, this whole Bangalore last fifty years from nineteen seventy, the planning, for example, I can tell you, last planned colony was Jayanagar mm. and Indranagar, lots too. Mm. Rest of it were unplanned. People just built wherever they wanted, and nobody paid attention to it. We are paying a price for that now. Yeah, I mean, to so all I don't the, think to I all the you blame the public. Don't blame the uh, government politician. People have to have common sense. They have to look around. I mean, they have to know that water flows down the hill, right, mm -hmm. and collects at the lowest point. And I am surprised that these guys who built in East Bangalore they are multi-millionaires. Mm -hmm. Okay. What happened to their common sense? That's the question I would like to ask. No, I actually, I, I mean, I actually empathize with them because I, they, I don't think they had that in their mind when they were buying those houses because they were already built. No, no, no. Package. They, didn't, they didn't build those houses. It was a, it was a pain. No, but uh, when, 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 uh, Roy, when you buy a house, the first thing you'd ask is the location. I agree, but yeah, I mean, it is what it is. But uh, at the end of the day. The point is that lack of planning, lack lack of structures. No, but where, no, but if somebody has built a house already, so that's the first mistake, right? Then the second mistake, you go and buy it. If, for example, people who are educated and rich make a point that I will not buy a house in a lowing area, that area will lose value. That's how market forces work, right? That is failure. But how many people do that is the question. I mean, market forces no, no, are also was, uh, heavily uh, impacted, impacted by sentiments, emotions. emotions. But emotions. but how about common sense? My point is that <laughs> I can tell you, I will never buy a house. Whenever I went to look for a house, first question I asked is, what is the elevation of that area? 
I mean, to me, that's common sense. There is nothing. I wish all of them were climate science scientists like you. No, no, no. They are not. No, no. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't agree with you. You don't need climate science knowledge. You ask any villager. He, he will know it better than urban guy. The villager knows how the river flows. Yeah, that's then, true. So, okay. what I'm trying to say is, urban Indians are lost touch with reality. Hmm. Okay. Uh, they are lost touch with reality of how the water flows, how the water collects. And that's why I, I tell in urban India, if you live in a rural India, you have to worry about where your wastewater goes. There is no waste system. Okay? We flush and we forget. But in a rural area we live, if you build a house, you have to have proper system, septic tank and so on. Otherwise, you are in trouble. In urban areas, all of us have become completely ignorant. We don't know where our system, where water comes, where water goes. That's the biggest mistake. I would blame the education system. Our primary school education should be, first, first priority is this. How does the water come to you? How does the water go? Mm. Right? Are you, are you a keen uh, supporter of desalination of seawater into drinking water? And do you think it will actually do mm. some impact? Desalination is a very uh, en energy process. intensive and you have to throw a lot of saline water back. Mm. It's a very serious problem. Okay? When you extract water from salt water, you get only small amount. 90% has to go by very little go. That you have to worry about, okay? But let me tell you, having a lot of problem to grow, we may have no choice but to do desalination. If you are in uh, Chennai and Mumbai, at some point it becomes a necessity. Uh, uh, yeah, you have no choice. But we have to find clever ways of disposing of that uh, uh, water which is not uh, become a fresh water to go back deep into the sea. We have to do there's no choice. But what I would argue is then in other parts of India, no close to the sea, where diesel is not an option, we have to learn to build cities in which everything is recycled. For example, already it's happening in Bangalore, all the people who build apartment complexes will recycle all their water. Yeah. Okay. Today I can tell you, you can read a very nice uh, paper which shows that recycled water is safer than river water. Mm. Okay. What water you're getting in Kaveri is polluted. All kinds of chemicals and so on. You are better off taking your own wastewater and and take it out. But we have sentiment; we won't drink it. But you can test it, and you can show that the system is well maintained. Water which is recycled is much safer. So the best thing is not to throw wastewater into the river and go all the way to the sea. You recycle, recycle all your water. water. And California is doing it, and India should follow that policy. Wherever rainfall is not much, first of all you. Harvest uh, your rainwater locally, and whatever you extra you get, make sure you recycle it. So that I'm happy about in Karnataka, the law has been made that all apartment complexes will have to recycle everything. It's cloud seeding a good thing or a no? Thing it, it will not solve problem. It's a political game people play. It, it gives a lot of scope of corruption. That's all. Okay, uh, you can do the analysis because people have done studies of cloud water seeding in Australia, the dry country. It is not economically viable. So you, if you don't conserve water, let it evaporate and then pick it up. I mean, that is uh, ridiculous, right? So best is conserve your water and not to go after cloud seeding. Cloud seeding, again, can be an emergency. Sometimes, you know, India will have a long drought. See, we are lucky. The last 100 years, we have not, never had more than two droughts continuously. Suppose you get four or five droughts. It yeah, happened, no it happened in the 18th century. Oh, it will be a crisis. Then we have to do it. But it is economically not viable. Sir, uh, the, the entrepreneur in me is also looking at different uh, industries that are actually, the motivation comes from climate change. Like, you know, plant based, we had a very good discussion about plant based yes. meat, which is growing. Yeah. Then there's yeah. organic farming, there's right. vertical farming yes. that is also coming up. And then there's also this whole new architectural design. I don't know whether you're aware of this, but there's an architectural design that is uh, floating uh, in the US and in Western Europe, which is basically a co covering the entire building, not with glass, but with with green grass and uh, all yeah, those Yeah, but things. I can tell you the first thing I must tell, I'm a great critic of the architects of India. They have again aped the West. Look at the IT sector huh? in Bangalore. They're all put gl glass. So they come and talk to me because I'm a heat transfer expert. How to uh, reduce the heat load of the building? I said, who wants to put glass? Because that's what they do in Los Angeles. I mean, we are aping, we are not building buildings which are in tune with our environment. 
our environment doesn't require glass is required in cold countries to trap heat but in in our country we should have a very different design with good ventilation and there are architects who, who propose that a british architect who stayed in kerala you can look it up he did the nobody followed him he lived in india all his life he showed how to build house in kerala which exploits the high rainfall and high humidity and to have a ventilation he built beautiful uh, uh, building for institutions but very few people followed that because we all learned from the west and for so now i hope they will all change again follow the west and do a green building because all our buildings including where i live is a concrete uh, what i call a uh, greenhouse it traps the heat hmm, and gives the heat at night so we should be building very very uh, thin buildings we don't store heat okay for example ironically in a country in a city like bangalore in month of march when it's very hot when we, when we think we need ac a guy in a slum is in a better shape because mm. he lives in a thin house with good ventilation the outside air is cooler but your inside the house is very warm because we live in concrete uh, shell which absorbs heat and stores it for 12 hours so it's bad design all over houses in bangalore are inappropriate for our climate okay and i hope architects will quickly change their way of thinking and build a design see we, we build designs which are which are not uh, uh, what do you call cement and con intensive will be cheaper but nobody is following that logic they try to build for example you can have a hollow cement okay mm. so it will have less weight you can make it equally strong there is technology available for that someone is not uh, catching on what are the industries do you think are going to flourish in because of this with the motivation of climate change evs is one yeah. plant based meat is one yeah. uh, name yeah. a few more yeah the building definitely i think that there is need a need because in india majority of people don't have houses huh? we are going to build a lot of houses in the next 50 years yeah. so that's why we need a revolution less use of materials less carbon footprint they are come with that and they are i think we cannot do an architect we need government to make laws that make laws they don't build buildings with this much of carbon footprint so green yeah. architecture basically yeah. yeah so there are few architects who are but it is not uh, what you call a movement what you need is a movement where people realize that what they have built is inappropriate for this local environment okay? what are the industries do you see i uh, transport of course you have covered we are power generation of course will be a big revolution all your coal power all yes. coal power plants will close down in the next 20 30 years just close down and everything has to be renewable and the biggest challenge we have is renewable is not available always solar is not available at night wind is not available during non monsoon month so you need a storage technology that is still evolving it is not yet battery and uh, hydro storage. what about nuclear power no nope. i'll tell you i am very unpopular with many people in india nuclear is the most dangerous technology you know why so each nuclear power plant creates waste which has a lifetime of 20000 years come again sir i'm sorry 20000 years ready activity is there okay how will you how will you keep it and india is a small country in america and germany they can store their ready to waste in uh, deserted areas okay arizona and uh, so many places where is the place in india india is a high density country right nuclear is inappropriate secondly we don't even have uranium oh. okay we are importing uranium now under that new agreement okay, yeah. so to me it's only totally inappropriate but unfortunately there's a lobby claiming that nuclear is a uh, low carbon footprint which is true but it has a high radioactive footprint okay and all developed countries want to avoid it we shouldn't jump into it okay whatever is there is there okay it will run for some more time so we should not have a technology which has the potential to create damage for 20000 years mm. but it looks like a nice solution okay? and a uh, second part is the pure economics today's cost of nuclear power per megawatt is 10 times that of solar mm. why would i do that i want to tell you the best uh, quotation for this is you have a nice nuclear power in the sun mm. let us use it let's not put a power plant next to my house okay i can tell you that even if nuclear power plant comes i can tell you all the people who are well off they don't want to plant next to the house 
Okay? You want it far away. Yeah. So, so that is, you can keep it in your house only. Huh? <laughs> it won't be a problem. Of course, okay. Anyway, there are people talking about technology. It will be so smart. You can develop. It has not yet come. It is a dream. To have a nuclear technology, which is completely uh, portable, uh, which will not create any waste. But that is still a dream. It has not yet come. It may come. Who knows? Uh, you know that. Okay with solar. You, can you know that. Solar. 40 years ago, there was a big uh, news item called the cold fusion. Somebody claimed uh, that they had a reaction going, a cold fluid fusion reaction. It turned out to be a, a fake. So the whole thing died down. Yeah, if somebody discovers a way to do fusion at room temperature, oh, that will be a revolution. We hope it will come. So I would say that we should do more research, look for uh, more. But the nuclear trunk we have today is inappropriate. Now, every now and then you hear about fusion breakthrough. I heard it for 60 years now. Nothing will happen in your lifetime. Okay? A lot of money you spent. I'm happy with basic research. It's good always. There are spin off. But you're not going to solve the problem in the next 30 years. We need a solution in the next 30 years. If we don't cut down our carbon in 30 years, we are doomed. Okay? We come to the next point you have already raised. Should we be pessimistic? My answer is no. We have time still, another 30, 40 years, by which you can transition to a renewable technology. If you do that, you will escape the worst impact of climate change. Okay? We can do it, but we cannot uh, relax and hope that it will happen. So you guys who are going to face the consequence of global warming have to put pressure on the system to rapidly decarbonize. If you don't do that, you are in trouble. Okay. So don't be too optimistic. But don't be too pessimistic either. Be cautiously optimistic that new technology has evolved rapidly and we can rapidly decarbonize so that we can live in a world where carbon footprint is close to zero. Not zero, close to zero. I think you have summed up everything that I wanted to hear and uh, also wanted, wanted to thank you uh, for uh, <coughs> giving your valuable insights, especially for the fact that uh, you know, we talk about climate change is always a doomsday prediction. There's yeah. also everything. Just the last bit, but we I want it very short from you. Please paint the worst case scenario uh, for us. If we, you said something very interesting. You said if we wait, we are all doomed. Yeah. What is that? I think the worst. What fear we have right now is that Greenland is melting. Mm -hmm. If all the ice in Greenland melts, it will affect the global ocean circulation. So when the water melts and uh, ice melts, the water, water density changes, it affects the slow circulation of the ocean. It's carrying heat from the tropics to the poles. If that stops, there will be catastrophe. Okay. The tropics will warm rapidly and the poles will cool because of ice melting. Mm. And it will be a catastrophe. And it is not science fiction. It has happened in the past, long time ago. Okay. But it happened very slowly. That's how Ice Age happened. If yeah. So to me, we have, we should not allow that to happen, but it can happen within the next 100 years if we continue our present way of living. So that's a warning everybody is giving that there is a potential stoppage of the circulation can happen maybe 30 years or 50 years from now, which we should not allow it to happen. That is a warning. Thank you for the warning and I hope it doesn't come true, sir. Yeah. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on this uh, particular podcast and uh, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. And I would say that in response podcast, we get lots of questions. I'll be happy to get involved again. Sure. Because it's my job to, More than happy uh, to. tell people about climate change and consequences. I'll be happy to, if there are any questions from, the, from the, your audience and they feel we are not covered all issues, we can have another session. Absolutely. I think this will not be one of the, this will not be one episode and we are going to do much more. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.